Goedenavond. In onze Amerika-serie vanavond het begin van het atoomtijdperk. In augustus 1945 werd Hiroshima in Japan in ongeveer 9 seconden verwoest door één enkele atoombom. En sindsdien is de wereld niet meer dezelfde. De dreiging van de kernoorlog en van de totale vernietiging hangen permanent boven ons hoofd. De man die verantwoordelijk was voor het maken van die eerste bom was een zachtaardige, cultuurminnende, apolitieke man, J. Robert Oppenheimer. Hij deed het uit angst voor het fascisme van Hitler dat de wereld bedreigde. Maar Duitsland had de oorlog al verloren voor die eerste bom tot ontploffing werd gebracht en voor Hiroshima. De film van vanavond gaat over Oppenheimer, die toen hij er later spijt van kreeg en zich verzette tegen het maken van de nog gruwelijker waterstofbom door de Amerikaanse regering staatsgevaarlijk werd verklaard. De film gaat ook over het verschijnsel dat wetenschapsmensen die eenmaal ergens mee bezig zijn daarmee doorgaan wat er ook gebeurt als een machine die niet meer is te stuiten. Dames en heren, de dag na Trinity. Stinson Beach, California, August 7, 1945. Dear Oppie, you are probably the most famous man in the world today, and yet I am not sure that this letter will reach you. But if it does, I want you to know that we are very proud of you. And if it doesn't, you will know it anyway. We have been irritated by your reticence these past few years, but under the itchy surface we knew that it was all right. That the work was progressing, that the heart was still there, and the warm being we have known and cherished. I can understand now, as I could guess then, the somber note in you during our last meetings. There is a weight in such a venture which few men in history have had to bear. I know that with your love of men, it is no light thing to have had a part, and a great part, in a diabolical contrivance for destroying them. But in the possibilities of death are also the possibilities of life. You have made history. We are happy for you. You may well ask why uh uh, people with a kind heart and hum humanist feelings, why they would uh, go and work on weapons of mass destruction. In 1904, het jaar waarin J. Robert Oppenheimer geboren werd, was de atoomom zelfs nog geen science fiction. Na de middelbare school in New York deed hij Harvard in drie jaar en slaagde summa cum laude. Hij sprak zes talen en wist nog niet of hij architect, dichter of natuurkundige zou worden. Zijn liefde voor natuurkunde bracht hem in de jaren twintig naar Engeland en Duitsland, waar het atoom zijn geheimen begon prijs te geven aan Einstein, Rutherford en Bohr. Europese geleerden herinneren hem zich later als de briljante, excentrieke jonge Amerikaan die zowel werken over theoretische natuurkunde als over 16e eeuwse Franse poëzie verslond. Een van zijn beste vrienden was de jonge Amerikaanse schrijver Francis Ferguson. Well, when I first knew him, he knew nothing about politics. He never read the newspaper. Uh, he was extremely ignorant about practical matters and he didn't care about them. Uh, and, uh, his whole life was in the intellect. Op zijn 25e werd hij, wat niet vaak voorkomt, tegelijk professor aan de Universiteit van Californië in Berkeley en aan de Technische Hogeschool in Pasadena. Hij verbreidde er radicaal nieuwe inzichten over het atoom en de principes van de kwantummechanica. Something that might have taken me months to have learned before, he would go over in minutes. And, uh... <laughs> Het was een heel, heel fast clip en een heel elegant manier. Robert Oppenheimer en zijn jongere broer Frank waren van welgestelde familie en groeiden op in New York. In de jaren dertig brachten ze elke zomer door op een kleine gehuurde boerderij in het woeste noorden van New Mexico. Ik 
everything my brother did would sort of be special. If he went off in the woods to take a leak, he'd come back with a flower. And not to disguise the fact that it might leak, but just to make it an occasion, I guess. It was a wonderful time for all of us. All the different guests, most of them physicists, uh, uh, brought some, some ideas and new ideas with them. Uh, also, uh, we, the meals were sort of strange, uh, sort of peanut butter and Vienna sausages and whiskey. And we'd get sort of drunk when we were high up, and we'd all act kind of silly, I guess. Maar ver van New Mexico, ver van Berkeley, kwam Adolf Hitler op. En Robert Oppenheimer was Joods en had vrienden en familie in Duitsland. Hij did not keep up with current events. He read novels or he read philosophy books or serious books. But uh, all of a sudden, and I think it was due in large part to uh, Hitler and to the Nazi persecution of the, due, of the Jews that he suddenly, uh, I think it must have been fairly suddenly, he suddenly realized that things were getting out of hand and that something had to be done about it by serious people. So he began reading. Hocon Chevalier doseerde Franse literatuur aan Berkeley en was actief in de linkse beweging. Oppenheimer en hij werden goede vrienden. On one of his many trips to the east on the train, he had taken the three volumes of Das Kapital and he had read them all in the original on his way to New York. In German? In German, yes. And uh, then shortly after, apparently, he bought the complete works of Lenin and read those. At uh, Berkeley, he'd read the Bhagavad Gita and learned Sanskrit, and was really taken by the, by the charm and the kind of general wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita. And some people seem to think he was uh, got very religiously involved in it, but that's not a true, true at all. End jaren 30. Terwijl Amerika een enorme economische crisis doormaakte, raakte Duitsland in de greep van het fascisme en woedde er in Spanje een burgeroorlog. Oppenheimer werd linkser. Cathy Harrison was communiste en had haar eerste man verloren in de Spaanse burgeroorlog. In 40 trouwde ze met Robert Oppenheimer. Kort tevoren waren Roberts jongere broer Frank en diens vrouw Jackie in Californië lid geworden van de communistische partij. Robert sloot zich niet officieel bij de partij aan, maar zijn linkse activiteiten bleven niet onopgemerkt. Terwijl oorlogswolken zich samenpakten boven Europa, zette de FBI Oppenheimer op een lijst van mensen die in geval van een nationale noodtoestand gearresteerd zouden worden. Back in 1938. Uh, Hahn and Strassmann in Germany discovered fission. And many people realized very quickly that it might be possible to make atomic bombs, to use fission uh, as an explosive, to use uranium as an explosive. I suppose that he was at that time profoundly impressed with the precariousness of the Allied situation, that after all, most of his friends were Europeans, many of them in countries which had been occupied by the Germans. The Germans looked as though they were the wave of the future at that time. He said there's the danger that this may mean the end of Western civilization. My brother viewed it as not just something persecuting uh, our own uh, relatives, but as a kind of thing that could be a wave that would walk over the United States as well. He wanted to help. He thought probably the best way to do this, where he had most competence, would be in uh, the atomic bomb work. And therefore, it was natural for him, almost necessary for him, that this is where he would put his effort. He built the atomic bomb, or he didn't build it, but he led the effort to build the atomic bomb because he thought this was necessary to save Western civilization. In 1939 begon men te vrezen dat Nazi-Duitsland al aan een atoombom werkte. Nadat Albert Einstein president Roosevelt gewaarschuwd had dat zo'n bom tot de mogelijkheden behoorde. 
Op last van Roosevelt kwam er een project van de grond dat tot 7 december 1941 weinig om het lijf had. De dag na Pearl Harbor verklaarden de Verenigde Staten Japan en Duitsland de oorlog. Het bomproject kreeg plotseling voorrang. Het Amerikaanse leger nam er de leiding van over. Onder de codenaam Manhattan District en onder het bevel van generaal Leslie Groves... werden op diverse plaatsen geheime laboratoria ingericht. Groves gaf Oppenheimer de leiding over een groep in Berkeley... die de wetenschappelijke grondslag voor een atoombom moest leggen. Oppenheimer, die zich een zwierige slappe hoed had aangemeten... ging prat op zijn nieuwe officiële titel. Coördinator Snelle Splijting. Dat was de tijd when de big change in zijn leven occurred. And it must have been during that time that the dream somehow got hold of him of really producing a nuclear weapon, which other people had been talking about. That he was the fellow who really did it. De Los Alamos Jongenschool, hoog op een rotsplateau, 75 kilometer ten noorden van Santa Fe, niet ver van de Oppenheimer boerderij. In de zomer van 1942 zagen de leerlingen steeds vaker laagvliegende legertoestellen overkomen. Een van hen, Sterling Colgate. Het was in de fall of 1942, toen deze plaats was invaded door uh, uh, een, een armada van uh, bulldozers en constructiecrew. Het uh, suddenly we uh, knew that the war had arrived here and these two uh, characters showed up, uh, Mr. Smith en Mr. Jones. Uh, One wearing a pork pie hat and the other a, a suit and a normal hat. And these two guys went around as if, uh, uh, well, one, they owned the place, which evidently they did. But more than that, as if their pseudonyms was a normal sort of thing to do. My God, I mean, there their pictures were in our, in our physics book, and we all had physics. One is the lead theoretical physicist of his age, and the other uh, uh, head of a major laboratory who had done the cyclotron and things like that. So we immediately knew that one, uh, uh, they felt that it was so important to be Oppenheimer and Lawrence that they had to have a pseudonym. Uh, two, that they were putting megabucks, uh, multi-megabucks, into what seemed to us the worst place in the world to have a laboratory. Oppenheimer had gevraagd om één afgelegen laboratorium waar de bom kon worden ontworpen en gemaakt. Generaal Groves gaf hem die jongenschool en benoemde Oppenheimer officieel tot wetenschappelijk hoofdopzichter. Zijn eerste taak was het om geleerden ertoe over te halen met hun gezin naar een niet nader omschreven plek te verhuizen voor zolang de oorlog duurde, om daar te werken aan een project dat hij soms al even min mocht beschrijven. Well, I was a young assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Stan Ulam, wiskundige en zijn vrouw Françoise. The war was on. I noticed that some other younger colleagues especially were disappearing from town. They couldn't tell where they were going. It was very secret. But when I learned that I'm supposed to go somewhere to New Mexico, uh, Francoise uh, wanted to know about the state of New Mexico. So I went to the library and borrowed one of these WPA books on various states, and there was one volume on New Mexico. And then. Looking at it, I noticed at the back of the book there was a list of previous borrowers. To my amazement, several names of people who just disappeared a week or two before were put down there as borrowers. Uit heel Amerika arriveerden wetenschappers en militairen. Vele reisden onder een schuilnaam. In Princeton, New Jersey, keek men op het station verbaasd op van de plotselinge vraag naar enkele reisjes naar een gehucht buiten Santa Fe. Very impressive, strange scenery, mountains, rocks. The desert. We crossed Rio Grande and arrived in a place full of little, well, how to call it, almost huts. Oppenheimer had vanuit het hele land wetenschappers en hun gezinnen bijeengebracht, weggeplukt van beroemde universiteiten. Los Alamos was een nooddorp, haastig opgetrokken houten gebouwen, zandwegen, kolenfornuizen en slechts vijf badkuipen. Voor het bouwen van de atoombom had Oppenheimer het puikje aan natuurkundigen, wiskundigen en scheikundigen opgetrokken. Ik geloof niet dat er ooit een assembly 
of so many first-rate people for one task. When I first came to the, the, to the United States, I got to know a lot of the young people who had been at Los Alamos. Most of them were very young. They'd just gone right into it without even finishing their scientific training. And for them, it was just the most marvelous time of their lives. People worked hard, scientists worked around the clock, and the people made up for the lack of big city life, and it was a lot of partying. We were very young, and it was just like a camp out. Liquor was short in the area, so in order to spice up the parties, we used lab alcohol. Lab alcohol is 200 proof, basically. Which is just exactly what you're looking for, for punch. If you were in a large hall and you saw several groups of people, the largest groups would be hovering around Oppenheimer. He was great at a party, and women simply loved him and still do. I found it extremely dashing in a sort of uh, elegant way. It was, for these young people, not only a great experience, it was also fun. It was, it was a lark. Yes, it was a good time. It was a good time in America. It was a good time to be American. It was a, a time when the whole country was pulling together uh, in, a, uh, uh, in a cause which even now I think was just. That is the idea that the Nazis would, uh, uh, Nazi Germany would win that war could have uh, led to, uh, it seemed to me, a thousand years of dark ages and everything that we meant by civilization could have come to an end. That's what it seemed to me was what the fight was about, or something pretty close to that. And most Americans felt that, and most Americans were in it just as, uh, as hard as they could be. Hun gemiddelde leeftijd was 29 jaar en hun taak was het construeren van een mechanisme dat binnen een miljoenste seconde een heftige kettingreactie kon ontketenen. Ze beschikten over twee dansorkesten, een ijssalon, padvinders en padvinsters, een geheim radiostation, een cyclotron en 7000 brandblussers. Somehow Oppenheimer put this thing together. He was the conductor of the orchestra or whatever it was. Somehow he created this fantastic Esprit. No matter who you talk to, they all lived it, and, and they all, I think, almost without exception, felt it most strongly that without him this wouldn't have happened, it couldn't have happened. Oppenheimer had zich een kleine gemeenschap voorgesteld van 30 wetenschapsmensen en hun gezinnen. Maar tegen 1944 beheerde hij een vestingstad met 6000 inwoners. Er waren zeven wetenschappelijke afdelingen. De kosten liepen op tot 56 miljoen dollar. The most striking contradiction is the fact that this man, who was so unworldly, so unpolitical in his youth, such a great scholar, so fond of metaphysical poetry, should suddenly emerge as the great administrator who put Los Alamos together and produced the atomic bomb. I saw him change from that uh, almost irresponsible intellectual bohemian... And radical. Radical person that he was that I, and that I had known at at Berkeley uh, to someone who was just completely dedicated to getting on with the war. Het was een vreemde nieuwe wereld. Prikkeldraad, lijfwachten, censuur op brieven, geheimen voor vrouw en kinderen. Well, I'd written, try to be so newsy when I was in Fort Leonard Wood, and when I came here, I would write and say, I'm out here in the West, and the scenery is beautiful, and the weather is just gorgeous. And my mother would write back and say, well, where are you really, and what are you doing? And I would write back and say, I'm out here in the West, and the weather is gorgeous, and the scenery is beautiful. And she never understood that until the war was over, and I could explain it to her. Eind 1944 kwam de Amerikaanse spionagedienst erachter dat het Duitse atoomproject was mislukt. Niettemin werd het tempo in Los Alamos kort daarna opgevoerd en ging men zes dagen per week werken. Everything was coming together, everything was going at a very rapid rate. We were building up to the Trinity test at that time. We were a great deal of production was 
of uh, devices to be used in the atomic bomb were being made. Everybody was working day and night. And it was very hard in the, you know, in the push to make that uh, test uh, to stop and think. In the Stille Zuidzee voerde de oorlog tegen Japan voort. Maar in de lente van 1945 kwam de overwinning in Europa. De nazi's hadden nog in geen jaren een atoombom kunnen bouwen. Duitsland gaf zich over, Europa was bevrijd. Eisenhower keerde zegevierend terug naar Amerika. Ik zou willen to dat ik denk nu dat ik op de tijd van de Germanse defeat dat ik zou hebben gestopt, taken stock thought it all over very carefully, and that I would have walked away from uh, Los Alamos at that time. And I've, in terms of all of my, everything that I believe in, before and during and after the war, I cannot understand why I did not take that, make that act. On the other hand, it simply was not in the air. I do not know of a single instance of anyone who had uh, made that suggestion or who did leave the time. There might have been someone that I didn't know, but uh, at the time, it just was not uh, something that uh, was part of our lives. We're, our life was directed to do one thing. It's as though we had been programmed to do that, and we, as automatons, were doing it. Amazing how the technology tools trap one. I mean, uh, they're so powerful that when... I, w I was impressed because most of the sort of fervor for developing the bomb came in a kind of anti-fascist fervor against Germany. But when VE Day came along, nobody slowed up one little bit. No one said, ah, well, the main thing, well, it doesn't matter now. We all kept working. And it wasn't because we understood the significance against Japan. It was because the, the machinery had caught us in its trap, and we were anxious to get this thing to go. The Faustian bargain is when you sell your soul to the devil in exchange for knowledge and power. And that, of course, in a way, is what Oppenheimer did, there's no doubt. He made this alliance with the United States Army in the person of General Groves, who gave him undreamed of resources, huge armies of people and uh, as much money as he could possibly spend, in order to do physics on the grand scale in order to create this marvelous weapon. And it was a Faustian bargain, if ever there was one. And of course, we are still living with it ever since. When once you sell your soul to the devil, then there's no going back on it. Well, I can't tell you exactly, but right over there between here and the, Os and the uh, high part of the Oscura Mountains, there where that little peak is on the McDonald Ranch is where they detonated the first atomic bomb. <clears throat> What was this country like then? About like it is now. 300 kilometer ten zuiden van Los Alamos bij Alamogordo, New Mexico. Een uitgestrekte verlaten prairie. Die koos Oppenheimer als proefterrein voor de eerste atoombom en noemde het Trinity Site. Vroeger was dit van de Apachen, maar eind 1944 woonden er slechts een handjevol veeboeren en kolonisten. Zij noemden de plek bij haar Spaanse naam, Jornado del Muerto, de route van de dood. Uh, I was put out of here in 42. Who put you out of here? Uh, the Corps of Engineers and the federal judge and so forth. And they said they had to have it for air to air gunnery range and so forth, you see. And later on, why it wound up being this, you see, when they got the atomic bomb to work and why they come in for a place and then they selected this right here. At that time, they were living, that is, the people that was assembling this bomb and preparing to shoot it was there at my place. Somewhere around five to seven hundred people, they said there. And uh, living in my house and around it and so forth, you see, with other buildings and so forth. It began in December with 15 men. In mei werkten er in het geheim een paar honderd burgers en militairen. S'nachts hoorden de boeren geweerschoten, soldaten die met mitrailleurs op antilopen jaagden. 
11 juli 1945. Een Pontiac arriveert op de McDonald's boerderij met daarin de totale voorraad plutonium ter wereld. Een kleine 10 pond. De koerier wil een kwitantie. De geschatte waarde 1 miljard dollar. Op verzoek van Oppenheimer heeft generaal Groves een geheime regeling getroffen met de gouverneur van New Mexico om in geval van nood de hele staat te evacueren. Now prior to the shot, back in the lab, there had been some speculation that it might be possible to explode the atmosphere, in which case the world disappears. Did you sense the, a lot of anxiety in your brother? A, lo a lot of anxiety in everybody, including my brother, um, both whether it would work or not work. Um, uh, I think mostly uh, that, but also um, it was you see, it was a time in which um, I think it, his interest in, in using the bomb to pr help produce a better world was, 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 didn't happen just after the war. But he really had hoped that Truman would tell Stalin about it fairly forthrightly. Of course, that didn't happen and set the stage almost at that instant to the Cold War rather than to an, a, a warmer um, uh, humanity. And so I think both of those things seemed, everything there was worrying him a great deal. Mm. Memo, 11 juli, 17 uur. Beide ladingen gereed. Zo nodig nog een dag doorwerken om de boel klaar te krijgen. Vraag extra mankracht. Memo, 12 juli, 16 uur. Gaten in mantel verzegelen, afplakken met plakband. Ladingen verpakken, binnenste en buitenste. Elk met twee reserveladingen. Memo, 13 juli, 13 uur. Montage begint. Polaire kap en verzegeling verwijderen. Monteurs nemen het over. Zijn tot 16 uur bezig met aanbreng actief materiaal. Verzegelingsgat wordt bedekt met schone doek. Explosievendienst neemt het over. Aanbreng hoofdlading zo langzaam mogelijk. Kettingen verwijderen. Werkvloer ontruimen. Memo, 14 juli, 8 uur. Hijskabels aanbrengen. Om 9 uur gereed voor eenheid X. Voetenbank monteur meenemen. Memo, 14 juli, 9 uur. Eenheid X wordt aangesloten onder toezicht explosievendienst. Toren platform testen met cementlading. Ontsteking aanbrengen volgens verklikschakeling. Explosievendienst houdt toezicht op voorzichtige behandeling. Als ontsteking eenmaal is aangebracht, geen elektriciteit bij eenheid X, verklikschakeling of enig ander deel van de bol. Alle tests moeten gebeuren voordat de bol is opgehezen. Daarna is het te laat. Memo, 14 juli, 17 uur. Knutselwerk volbracht. Moeten we de aalmoezenier roepen? Inzetten kostte een dollar. Edward Teller wedde op een explosie gelijk aan die van 45.000 ton TNT. Oppenheimer wedde laag, op 3.000 ton. Jonge technici hoorden tot hun schrik hoe Enrico Fermi wedde op de mogelijkheid dat de hele staat New Mexico in de as werd gelegd. Um, I think he and I were lying down right next to each other, flat in the desert, right outside the, the um, control hut um, at the time the bomb went off. And we had prepared ourselves with glass, and uh, it, when we, we could hear the countdown, when it went off, we all were looking through the glass, and then we saw what was just a tremendous uh, 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 overpowering uh, vision of this thing happening, seeing the mountains small beside it, seeing perhaps with some kind of beauty, but awesome was what I would call it, as it slowly developed, went up in the air, and uh, made those, the whole desert light up as at noon, and appear small. A large desert, the rimmed by mountains, appear to be a small place. 
And that was just something that, uh, once that had happened, uh, I was a different person from then on. At the time it went off, it was, I think, absolutely, it wasn't, I knew sort of what would happen, but I didn't expect the heat from the flash at five miles away to be uh, nearly that intense. And then there was a cloud, sort of the radioactive cloud went and sort of hovered there. And I and Ken had been working on developing escape routes because if that thing had gone a little bit uh, south, it would have fallen, been fall out on the camp and we would have had to get out to the to the south rather than where the north was, the road was to the north. And um, so there was this sense of this ominous cloud uh, hanging over us. It was so brilliant purple with all the radioactive glowing. And it just seemed to hang there forever. Of course, it didn't. It, went, it was, must have been just a very short time for, until it went up. But it was very terrifying. And the thunder from the blast, um, it bounced on the rocks and then went, I don't know where else it bounced, but it never seemed to stop, but not like an ordinary echo of a thunder. It just kept echoing back and forth in that Jornado de Muerto. It was a very scary time when, that, when it went off. Um, and God, I wish I could remember what my brother said, but um, I can't. Uh, but I think we just said it worked. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what we said, both of us, it worked. And nobody knew it was going to work. He was in the, uh, in the forward bunker. And then when he came back, there he was, you know, with his hat. You've seen pictures of that, Robert's hat and so on. And uh, he came to where we were in the, in the headquarters, so to speak. And um, the way his walk was like high noon. I think it's the best I could describe it, this kind of strap. He'd done it. It felt like an earthquake. We lived in a good adobe house, and it just said, Shh, And he said, my goodness, that's an earthquake, and wonder if it hurt the house. And he got out of bed, and he got up, and he says, I want you to come look. The sun's rising in the long, wrong direction. So we knew something had happened over here, and we had a car along had a radio in it. So we kept that radio on, and long at noon, they up and told us, you know, that there's an ammunition that went off. We were headed up to Albuquerque to take her back to school, and we were between Palvadera and Limitar when we saw this great big flash of light. And my sister, she said, what happened? And that was, she got to see the light, and it just seemed like it lit up the whole prairie all around us. Was there anything odd about your sister asking about the light? Yes, because she was blind. When did you find out what happened? Well, it was quite a while, you know, until they began to talk about the cattle, you know, that the hair was turning white on them, like frost, you know. It looked like they had frost on their backs and so forth. The way we noticed them was the, uh, where that fallout fell on the cow, she's lying on her left side while her right side would get burned. And the uh, particles of dust that were radioactive would fall on her, and then they caused a burn like a scald. And the hair, instead of coming back red, like on a Hereford cow, would come back white, just like a, a saddle burn on a black horse. And old man Max Smith that had the white store up there had a black cat, just as black as the ace of spades. And that thing had white spots all over it after the atomic blast. He sold it to some tourist for $5, I think, as a curiosity. <laughs> Iwo Jima, de Golf van Leijten, Mindanao, de Marshall-eilanden. Alleen op Okinawa al 50.000 Amerikaanse doden en gewonden, 110.000 Japanse doden en gewonden. Het begin van het einde voor Japan, uitputtingsbombardementen. Duizenden B-29'ers laten een regen van brandbommen neerdalen op bijna alle steden.
Harry Truman, begin 1945 president geworden, na de dood van Roosevelt, eist volledige overgave. Our demand has been, and it remains, unconditional surrender. Japan lag in puin. De meeste grote steden waren verwoest. Tokio was in de as gelegd. Meer dan een miljoen burgers omgekomen. De Japanners vochten door. Why did the bomb get dropped on people at Hiroshima? I would say it's almost inevitable that it would have happened. Simply because all the bureaucratic apparatus existed by that time to do it. The Air Force was ready and waiting. There had been prepared big airfields in the island of Tinian in the Pacific from which you could operate. The whole machinery was ready. The president would have had to be a man of iron will in order to put a stop to it. The question was whether we wanted to save our people and Japanese as well and win the war or whether we wanted to take a chance on being able to win the war by killing all our young men. And uh, in those days, most people did not realize the qualitative difference between the atomic bomb and the number of ordinary bombs. There was really no uh, immediate feeling that the world is changing as a result, but rather that it would be a good way to win the war more quickly. So I would say it was nobody's fault that the bomb was dropped. As usual, the reason it was dropped was just that nobody had the courage or the foresight to say no. Certainly not Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer gave his consent in a certain sense. He was on a committee which advised the Secretary of War and that committee did not take any kind of a stand against dropping the bomb. Hiroshima, a stad so groot als Den Haag. Een van de weinige steden die niet met brandbommen was gebombardeerd. Al maanden tevoren was bevel gegeven bepaalde Japanse steden te ontzien om des te beter het effect van de nieuwe bom te kunnen vaststellen. The, uh, the, the announcement that, of Hiroshima, I think I was in the hall right outside my brother's office and it came over the sort of loudspeaker that went through, was distributed throughout, um, that the bomb had been dropped and that it had devastated that so the first reaction was, thank God it wasn't a dud. But before the whole sentence of the broadcast was finished, when Sutton got this horror of all the people that had been killed. Uh, and I don't know why, up to then, I don't think we'd really, I'd really thought of all those flattened people. Um, we had talked often about having a demonstration where there weren't people maybe on the mainland so that the military would see it, but where there weren't people. And then the thought that, they had, that they'd actually dropped it on a place where all those people were, and the image of those people, which came before any pictures of it, uh, really was pretty awful. But the first thing was, I'm sure, was, thank God it worked. The first reaction which we had was one of fulfillment. Now it has been done. Now the work that we have been engaged in for so many years has contributed to the war. The second reaction was, of course, one of shock and horror. What have we done? What have we done? And the third reaction, it shouldn't be done again. You were very depressed. I came back from San Francisco and uh, found you very depressed. You, in, 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 as a, in opposition to your euphoria when the war, uh, the, uh, at VE Day, 
when we had that very nice party and uh, you started throwing the garbage cans around, uh, you were uh, very depressed and uh, we didn't have a party. I think there was a party. I don't even know if we went. Mm -hmm. Were you depressed? Yes, oh, yes, I depressed. remember being just ill. With the, uh, just sick. Uh, sick with the, to the, at the point that I thought it would be, <clears throat> uh, you know, vomit. I was so uh, overwhelmed when it happened that, uh, that that thing had happened. Still am. <laughs> what was what was Robert's reaction to the news from Hershey? I, th I don't know. I, th um, I, th I can't imagine that it was very different. A, a, a feeling that, uh, an initial feeling that, thank God it wasn't a dud, and an almost immediate horror of what had really happened. Hiroshima, 6 augustus 1945. De eerste uraniumbom ontplofte met een lichtflits die zo fel was dat je hem vanaf een andere planeet zou hebben kunnen zien. Meer dan 100.000 doden, 40.000 gewonden, 20.000 vermisten. Brandwonden, blindheid, stralingsziekte. Allemaal binnen 9 seconden. Zelfs vandaag lijden en sterven er nog mensen aan de gevolgen. Drie dagen later een tweede bom, een plutoniumbom op Nagasaki. 80.000 doden. Begin september werd een groep wetenschappers uit Los Alamos naar Japan gestuurd om het effect van de twee bommen te bestuderen. Een van hen was Robert Serber. Well, you know, everybody, we have defense, defense mechanisms of some kind that build up. I mean, uh... And under, under any uh, under stresses of that kind, somehow you uh, you get hardened to it in a couple of days, no matter what you see. And uh, you manage you manage to survive that way. I'm sure it happens to all soldiers in all wars. But the uh, I mean the thing that was really astonishing about the whole thing was that. Uh, Bill Penny and I wandered around Nagasaki and, and Hiroshima, you know, for several weeks, uh, complete, you know, completely alone on our on our own, and the, we had no difficulty at all with the people. They were uh, perfectly friendly. Not well, I'd say not really friendly, but 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 there was no antagonism visible. We wandered around the ruins among people whose families had all been killed. We had no feeling of danger at all. It's a piece of the wall of a schoolhouse in a schoolroom in Hiroshima, which about half a mile from uh, where the bomb went off, and it's flash burned, scarred by broken glass, and you can see the shadows of the uh, of the window sash and the and the uh, and the cord of the uh, shade and and from the the angle of at which this shadow was cast, we could me we could measure the height at which the bomb went went off. And this was the evidence that it really went off at the height it was supposed to in Hiroshima. At the end of the war, then I gave up my uh, clearance and I've not worked on didn't work on nuclear energy in any. Uh, in any of its aspect on the development or of, on bombs. Um, I, I don't, it's, it's somehow, um, I can't feel that it was something that I should, would not have done, um, uh, or should not have done at the time, that is, that the, um, that the reasons for doing it, the, the worry about fascism, the, um, were, were quite valid. The sense that um, there was almost no way of stopping this from being done. Uh, I think it would have been good to have stopped a little sooner, maybe after VE Day. I think it certainly would have been good never to have um, used the thing on the city, uh, and certainly never to have used tw two of them. Dear Hokan, your letter, your marvelous warm letter, was one of the very few things that brought warmth to us over these troubled days. A few days after the surrender, we went over to our ranch for a little time of solitude, horses, 
and the slow return to sanity. We are not sure we'll be coming back to Berkeley for a permanent, despite the ties that make us want to. We are not too sure of anything personal, longing, both of us, so much for stability, yet knowing that we have been put in a time and a place where we may not be able in conscience to attain it. The circumstances are heavy with misgiving and far, far more difficult than they should be had we power to remake the world to be as we think it. De geheimzinnigheid werd opgeheven. De meeste Amerikanen meenden dat de atoombom een beslissende rol had gespeeld bij het beëindigen van de oorlog. De geleerde professor, de onwereld liefhebber van metafysische poëzie met zijn linkse verleden, werd op slag een nationale held, een beroemdheid. De vader van de atoombom. In 1947 werd hij hoofd van het invloedrijke Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. Hij was daar de baas van Einstein. Maar deze eerste jaren na de oorlog bracht hij veel tijd door in Washington... waar men hem in regeringskringen graag om advies vroeg. Hij had zitting in zo'n 25 commissies, getuigde herhaaldelijk voor het congres... en werd zelfs gevraagd om zich verkiesbaar te stellen. Hoewel hij de regering adviseerde omtrent haar atoomarsenaal, pleitte hij onverzettelijk en openlijk voor internationaal toezicht op atoomwapens. En his sense of what he wanted to accomplish when he was in the government had less to do with physics than it had to do with uh, with the with the um, uh, sensible use of the of this awful instrument that we made. I have been asked whether, in the years to come, it will be possible to kill 40 million American people in the 20 largest American towns by the use of atomic bombs in a single night. I am afraid that the answer to that question is yes. I have been asked whether... The Oppenheimer tried to maintain control of the atomic energy enterprise to prevent the Air Force from abusing the weapons that he had created. I think the only hope for our future safety must lie in a collaboration based on confidence and good faith with the other peoples of the world. I think he felt that he wanted to make a big difference. Um, I, would arg I argued with him quite a lot after the war. Um, I felt that the, um, the kind of big difference would happen if one really taught people a lot about the dangers of the bomb, about the possibilities of cooperation. He said there wasn't time for this. He'd been in the Washington scene. He saw that everything was moving. He felt that he had to change things um, from within. History again and again shows that we have no monopoly on ideas, but we do better with them than most other countries. He was a philosopher king in his own mind, a man of wisdom who could get along with other men of wisdom who also had power. He had the way of impressing himself very strongly as a wise man on people who were influential. But it is certainly not possible to take the definition of atomic energy and the prohibition against indus helping other nations industrially, literally. It is certainly not possible to do that, Mr. Senator, because everything we do is contrary to it. Everything we do is what? Contrary to it. De wereld was veranderd na de oorlog. In Amerika zag men een nieuwe dreiging, het Russische en Chinese communisme. Wapenbeheersing viel niet in goede aarde en al helemaal niet meer toen de Russen in 1949, veel eerder dan werd verwacht, hun eigen atoombom tot ontploffing brachten. De wapenwetloop was begonnen en Oppenheimers aansporing tot internationale samenwerking vond in politieke kringen minder gehoor dan het advies van zijn wetenschappelijke collega Edward Teller. Zelfs tijdens de oorlog in Los Alamos pleitte Teller al voor de ontwikkeling van een geheim wapen radicaal anders en nog verwoestender dan de atoombom. De waterstofbom. De adviescommissie van de kernenergiecommissie onder voorzitterschap van Oppenheimer verzette zich in een geheim rapport tegen onmiddellijke ontwikkeling van de waterstofbom. Zowel op technische als op morele gronden. Ondanks het advies van de commissie gaf president Truman opdracht die waterstofbom te ontwikkelen. 
In Los Alamos ging een groep wetenschapsmensen aan het werk. Robert Oppenheimer was er niet bij. Dit is een atoombom, ongeveer de grootte van de bom die Hiroshima verwoestte. In 1950 vond men hem al te zwak voor de Amerikaanse defensie. De waterstofbom zou duizend keer zo krachtig worden. Op een ochtend in november 1952 werd het eiland Ilugalab in de stille Zuidzee door de eerste waterstofbom van de aardbodem weggevaagd. Het enige wat overbleef was een kilometers grote krater in de oceaanbodem. Een ongelovig Amerika zag hoe de Russen hetzelfde jaar nog hun waterstofbom tot ontploffing brachten. Het anticommunisme van senator McCarthy overheerste de jaren 50. Toen hij openlijk op het linkse verleden van Oppenheimer wees, zagen sommigen dat als de opening van de jacht op Oppenheimer. Uh, a lot of close relatives, of course, communists. That doesn't, again, doesn't make him a communist. But his wife, uh, admittedly, was a, uh, the wife of a, an official of the Communist Party. Uh, brother, a very active communist. Again, as I say, McCarthy viel Oppenheimer niet rechtstreeks aan, maar hij had een klimaat helpen scheppen waarin president Truman gedwongen werd serieus aandacht te besteden aan een brief van een voormalig congresmedewerker waarin Oppenheimer beschuldigd werd van spionage voor de Russen. Dertien jaar stond hij onder toezicht van universiteitspolitie, FBI en geheime dienst. Zijn telefoon werd afgetapt. Informanten rapporteerden over hem en soms werd hij door vijf agenten tegelijk geschaduwd. Het meeste was oud nieuws, materiaal dat in het verleden, toen Oppenheimer onmisbaar was, terzijde was geschoven. Maar toen Eisenhower in 1954 het dikke dossier ontving, trok hij onmiddellijk Oppenheimers bevoegdheden in. In afwachting van een gerechtelijk onderzoek. Hij had heel erg het gevoel dat hij het beste was aan de United States in the years during the war and after the war. In my personal opinion, he did. But it, others did not agree. And in 1954, he was hauled before a tribunal and accused of being a security risk, a risk to the United States, a risk To betray secrets. Het onderzoek werd uitgevoerd door de Kernenergiecommissie, achter gesloten deuren. Zonder fotografen, journalisten en televisie. Zelfs Oppenheimers advocaten moesten de zaal uit als er geheime documenten te sprake kwamen. De vraag was of er aan Robert Oppenheimer, de voornaamste ontwerper van de atoombom, staatsgeheimen konden worden toevertrouwd. Naast talrijke Aantijgingen in verband met zijn linkse verleden werd Oppenheimer met name beschuldigd van verzet tegen de waterstofbom op technische, politieke en morele gronden. Schadelijk voor Oppenheimer was de getuigenis van zijn vroegere collega uit Los Alamos, Edward Teller. Deze vader van de waterstofbom had al eerder tegen regeringsfunctionarissen geklaagd dat Oppenheimer een moeilijke, ijdele man was die de ontwikkeling van de waterstofbom op morele gronden had tegengewerkt. Tijdens het onderzoek liet Teller zich wat beheerster uit, maar hij betoogde dat Oppenheimer geen toegang tot staatsgeheimen mocht krijgen. De meerderheid van de getuigen, waaronder Nobelprijswinnaars en regeringsadviseurs, kwam voor Oppenheimer op, maar het mocht niet baten. De kernenergiecommissie besloot dat Oppenheimer niet betrouwbaar was en ontzegde hem de toegang tot staatsgeheimen. Hij is door de Amerikaanse regering nooit meer om advies gevraagd en heeft nooit meer met kernenergie gewerkt. He was not the same person afterwards. I think it really knocked him for a loop. Uh, he, he, he felt frustrated in accomplishing what he hoped to do in the way of, of getting peace. He felt um, really 
injured by not being part of the, of the, by not being respected in government and official circles. He wanted to get back into that, I think. Um, I don't know why, but, uh, but I, I think it's one of these things where there's a, where you get the taste of it, it's hard to, to not want it. Uh, Dr. Oppenheimer, could you tell us uh, what your thoughts are about what our atomic policy should be? No, I, I, I can't do that. I'm not, not close enough to the facts, and I'm not close enough to the, to the thoughts of those who are worrying about it. What your thoughts are about the uh, proposal of Senator Robert Kennedy that uh, President Johnson uh, initiate talks with a view to uh, halt the spread of nuclear weapons? It's uh, 20 years too late. It should have been done the day after Trinity. De atoombom die Robert Oppenheimer heeft gebouwd en de waterstofbom die naar hij hoopte nooit gebouwd kon worden, zijn niet meer weg te denken. Sinds de Trinity-explosie in 1945 zijn er meer dan 1200 kernbommen tot ontploffing gebracht. De sterkste was 4000 keer zo krachtig als de bom die Hiroshima in de as legde. I felt it myself. The glitter of nuclear weapons, it is irresistible if you come to them as a scientist. To feel it's there in your hands to release this energy that fuels the stars, to let it do your bidding, and to perform these miracles to lift a million tons of rock into the sky. It, it is something that gives people an illusion of illimitable power, and it is in some ways responsible for all our troubles, I would say. This, what you might call technical arrogance, that overcomes people when they see what they can do with their minds. We knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. Dit was het voor vanavond. In onze volgende uitzending gaan we door op de nucleaire ontwikkelingen in Amerika. Dan ziet u de atoombende, twee gevallen, Paul Jacobs en Karen Silkwood. Twee verhalen over een journalist en een chemisch analyste die er probeerden achter te komen hoe het zat met de bovengrondse atoomproeven van het Amerikaanse leger en met de veiligheid van de Amerikaanse atoomindustrie. Beiden moesten hun onderzoek met de dood bekopen. Tot over vier weken. Thank <laughs> you.